Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to History Happy Hour, Bob Ross. My name is Callie McCune, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Indiana Historical Society. I'm so excited to have so many of you here tonight to talk about a Hoosier icon that you may not have realized is a Hoosier icon. So at the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana storyteller connecting people to the past. We do this by collecting millions upon millions of pieces of paper that tell Indiana's unique story. These are things like books and paintings, letters and photographs, diaries, maps, more than I can list tonight. And then we try to find intriguing and unexpected ways to share and remember the past, whether that is through publications, exhibitions, or events like this. It's through these pieces that we tell the diverse, unconventional, even saucy stories of Indiana and to inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we're here to dive deep into the life and legacy of Bob Ross, who taught us that anyone can paint happy little trees and fluffy clouds on his television show, which was filmed at the public broadcasting studios in Muncie, Indiana for many years. So before I introduce Cheyenne and Jessica to get us started this evening, I have just a few pieces of logistics. For tonight's event, Cheyenne and Jess will talk for about 35 minutes and then we'll open it up to your questions. If you do have questions as we go along, please feel free to drop those in the question and answer section. We will be keeping an eye on them and then pepper them in through the second half of the program. We know you're all muted tonight, but we do wanna hear your thoughts. Please um, feel free to add your comments to the chat box as we go along. For instance, you can start by telling us what you're drinking tonight. Um, we will also be putting um, links and URLs in that chat. Um, if you miss one tonight, don't worry. Um, we'll be sending them out in a thank you email tomorrow morning. Just make sure that when you do add a comment in the chat, you reply to both panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see. And just so you know, this program is being recorded. You can catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org, in the upcoming weeks. If you enjoy this program, we hope you'll consider coming back for more. We have more history happy hours coming at you in the upcoming weeks. Join us on March 25th as we look at the history of Hoosier hysteria with Ron Newland and talk all about basketball as um, the Big Ten tournament or as the Big Ten tournament and the um, and all of college basketball come right here um, to our back door. And then keep an eye out for other history happy hours coming soon on the polio vaccine, Works Progress Administration, and a lot more. We'll have registration links up for those shortly. So without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to my colleague, Cheyenne Grimes, uh, who works with me in the Education and Engagement Department at IHS to get us started. Hey, Cheyenne, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you, Callie? I'm great. I know I'm excited to talk about Bob Ross, and I know you are too, right? I am so excited about it. <laughs> um, well, like Callie said, my name is Cheyenne, and um, I am an intern at the um, Indiana Historical Society in the Education and Engagement Department, um, and we are going to be talking with Jessica Jenkins. Um, Jessica has been working in museums for over 10 years with specialties in collections and exhibit curation. Uh, she has worked as the curator of collections for the Litchfield Historical Society in Litchfield, C Connecticut. Um, she now serves as the vice president of collections and storytelling for Minnetrista in Muncie. Uh, she, has she is a published author, co-authoring a book called House of Worth Fashion Sketches. Her most, her most recent book, Exploring Women's Suffrage Through 50 Historic Treasures, was um, released last year. Tonight we'll be discussing the life of Bob Ross and his impact on Indiana and how his legacy lives on today um, for over only 25 years later. Hi, Jessica, how are you? I'm good, Cheyenne. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, just before we start, I want to say I'm so excited about having talking about Bob Ross that I even brought some props. I have my finger puppet <laughs> um, and my Funko Pop. So um, I'm really excited. So since this is a happy hour, we um, have to start off with the question, what are you drinking tonight? And is there a drink that you think that would represent Bob Ross? I can answer both in one. <laughs> I am drinking iced tea tonight. Iced tea was Bob Ross's favorite beverage hand over fist every time 
He always had it on hand when he was at the PBS station filming The Joy of Painting. And if you look at photos of him, oh, there's one, when he's out to dinner, that's that's nice tea right there. So all iced tea all the time. So that's what I'm having tonight in honor of Bob. I didn't even know that. And I'm also drinking iced tea. Perfect. So, <laughs> that is perfect. Um, so as we dive into Bob Ross, um, I want to ask you how you got introduced to Bob Ross and um, how did Minatrista decide to take on Bob Ross's experience? Yeah, so from the personal side, you know, I, I was a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s when The Joy of Painting was first airing on PBS. And like a lot of kids, I was that kid that was homesick from school and we did not have cable at my house. So, you know, we had a handful of options. So PBS and its daytime programming was pretty popular. So I was first introduced to Bob when I was a kid and I will be honest and transparent here. I used to flip past him really quickly. <laughs> but when I first started working at Minatrista, you know, I was really getting to know the collection there, and we have a wonderful collection of historic artifacts and archives that relate to East Central Indiana and the history of Muncie, and on our art storage racks were a handful of paintings that caught my eye, and I thought, wait, what are those? Th those don't look like the paintings I usually see in fine art collections, and they're Bob Ross original paintings, so we've had paintings of Bob's in our collection for many, many years. We actually were the first museum ever to host an ex exhibition of his work, which was back in 1991. And we worked directly with Bob then to do that. So at Minatrista, we've been really thinking about how to really engage our community in doing community storytelling and telling stories about our community from our community to really build pride in, you know, in this place, in Muncie, in East Central Indiana. And so one thing led to another. And this, this story of Bob Ross that we have so well documented in our collection really pinged up. And what makes it so special is Minatrista now owns the former Ball family home that in the 1970s and 80s was WIPB-TV. It's an old house and the PBS station had their studios in it. So that's a piece of, you know, kind of power of place on our site. So we were using it for staff offices and we thought, you know what, let's let's flip this around. Let's look at this in a different way. So we were able to really activate that space where Bob was actually standing, painting, filming. So for us, it made complete sense to, to tell that story on our site at Minatrista. That's awesome. I haven't been able to go to the Bob Ross experience yet. It is definitely on my list for uh, post COVID. Um, yeah. For sure. So you did mention um, kind of the sense of place for Muncie. So one question that I'm sure a lot of our audience is thinking is why did Bob, Bob come to Indiana and how did his um, home base become Muncie for this program? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. We actually, I hear that a lot from people of, hmm, Indiana. Was Bob from Indiana? So he was not originally from Indiana, but he definitely as an adult considered himself kind of, you know, the adopted Hoosier. He was born down in Florida and after, you know, a military career, he kind of took up a second career of being a painting instructor. And part of that was traveling around teaching painting workshops. So he was really familiar with the Midwest um, because of his travel schedule coming through. So in 1981, Bob filmed the first season of The Joy of Painting out at a PBS station in Virginia. And for a handful of reasons that didn't really work out. So Bob and his business partners were looking for a new location that might be interested in filming this painting TV series for them. And honestly, it's kind of like the stars aligning. Um, Bob and his business partner, Annette Kowalski, came into Muncie because they had a painting workshop, a class scheduled to happen in town. And what they ended up doing is they ran an advertisement on WIPB. And you might be thinking, hold on, PBS doesn't run commercials. That sounds a little fishy and weird. There was a short period of time where PBS was running an advertising test and they were testing out the idea of advertising. And there were only a handful of stations around the country that was doing this, but Muncie's was one of them. So they bought a little ad time on the PBS and they ran that and they sold out their workshop like hand over fist. So many people wanted to come. 
So they did what any good business people would do. And they literally walked down the street from the painting workshop to the PBS station and said, I need to speak to the station manager. So when Jim Needham came downstairs, they just point blank said, what's the deal? We sold out our painting workshop here. What's so special about this place? And Jim Needham said, our PBS station is special because we're committed to this community. We're committed to quality product. We're committed to Hoosiers. And Muncie's special because people here care. And that's why people are signing up for your workshop because people are interested. They're, you know, they want to learn and they just care. So one thing led to another. And that's, that's how Bob ended up in Muncie. And from there, it was, you know, just years of honestly kind of a love affair between him and the PBS station because he just loved it so much. And it was, it was really a home for him. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, so it's funny as I watched Bob Ross as an adult for the first time and I had no idea that he was from Indiana. Um, so that kind of connected me with him and I thought that was awesome. Um, so you mentioned his time in the military. Um, so one of the things that I love about watching old episodes of Bob, um, Bob's show is his calm and smooth demeanor. Um, did, you, did you ever, sorry, did he ever talk about how that came to be um, and how did his time in the military influence this? Yeah, so Bob absolutely has that really <laughs> calming <laughs> capability, right? Where you might turn on the show to watch it, you might turn it on to take a nap, <laughs> maybe 50-50 chance. So Bob occasionally did talk about that, that very calming presence and how, yes, that was natural in him, but as a painting instructor, that's something that he worked on really specifically. During his time in the military, he for a time served as a drill sergeant. He also, you know, spent many, many years in the military, which was a very, you know, structured system. And so after leaving that world, he came out not wanting to have to be the drill instructor. He came out wanting to be very calm and very approachable. And one of the things that's really interesting though, that's kind of the other side of that is that on one hand, he kind of had this, and now I'm going to work in the very non-military way. The other part of it is that his military service so impacted the way that he worked. It's, it's really, really interesting that regimented, very planned out, very methodical way of life. He was absolutely that person as a real person. He looked so off the cuff on, you know, on TV, but he had every minute planned out and knew what he was going to do. And that was all because he was so regimented and he knew that he needed, you know, to get in a full painting in 27 minutes on TV, which is quick to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I take like three days to paint. <laughs> um, right, me too. Yeah, so I can't even imagine getting it done that quickly. Um, so from the photos that were just shown, he doesn't have his iconic hairstyle. Um, so, and I think that that is something that people think is just him, right? They just think of the fro. Um, nope. So when did the, um, he start growing that and how did that become to be? Yeah, so he had that, you know, kind of stick straight hair as a kid and as an adult, not a single curl in there. When he retired from the military and started wanting to pursue this career as a painting instructor, um, kind of made a deal with his wife, which was, I want to travel. I want to do this. You know, this is my passion. I want to see if I can make it work. And she fully supported him in that and wanted to do that. But that meant that money was a little tight. So, you know, a lot of people wonder if this is kind of, you know, urban legend. It's absolutely not urban legend. Bob got his hair permed and therefore got the fro as a money saver. His, his wacky idea was, is if I perm my hair, I won't have to cut it as often. <laughs> So I'll save money on haircuts. He was, he seriously was just, he was the most practical down to earth guy that this was his way of saving money was perming his hair. And actually I have it on very good authority from talking to a lot of people that knew him personally. He eventually really wanted to get rid of that. You'll actually see one series, I think maybe series 13 of the show where his fro gets a lot tighter and closer to his head because he got it cut down. 
because he really was tired of that Afro. And at that point, the company, the Bob Ross company that he helped found had made their logo his his head and his hair. And they're like, oh, Bob, can't really get rid of that now. It's our logo. It's whatever, you know, how people know you and recognize you. So he just kind of shrugged and laughed it off and said, okay, well, I guess I'm stuck with it. So he kept it. I'm sure that he regretted that decision <laughs> right I think away. He might have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so of course we would be remiss if we didn't talk about um, his painting. Um, so um, how did Bob get into painting in the first place? Um, and of course, how did that lead him to having his own TV program? Yeah, so Bob was always an artistic kid, not necessarily with painting, um, but he was a sketcher, he was a drawer. I think he maybe spent more time doodling <laughs> during class at school than anything else. But more importantly, um, he was always just very creative and worked with his hands a lot. His father was a carpenter, and so he learned that craft from his dad. His mom was very hands-on outside in nature. He learned that. So he'd always just had an interest in, you know, being a creative with his hands. So as an adult, when he was in the military, he started taking painting classes um, up at the USO, up where he was stationed in Alaska. And... He was also a bartender on the side. And what does bartending have to do with painting? Well, the bar where he worked used to sometimes have on a PBS painting show with a gentleman called Bill Alexander. And Bill Alexander had a TV show called The Magic of Oil Painting. And Bob saw that and he fell in love with it. So he'd been taking painting classes. He then wanted to learn um, Bill's technique. So Bob just jumped in with two feet when he retired from the military and said, you know, I'm really loving painting as a hobby and I want to do this as a career. And that's how he got into painting. And from there, it just led one thing into another. And the TV show itself, in many ways, was not for fame. It was not for the sake of a TV show, but the TV show for Bob was an advertising venue. He could advertise his technique. He could advertise his classes and he would publish an instructional book that went with each series that would cover the paintings that were in that series. So actually it's like the, the, the TV episodes were a big commercial. So people would buy the instructional books. And in, in turn, it's funny because the TV show is the part that's lived on the most beyond all the rest of it. Yeah, that's funny that you say that as I actually have been looking for some of those instructional booklets, but they're way too out of my price range. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's super cool that they did that along with the instructional videos. Mm -hmm. um, so you did mention Bill Alexander and um, just from my current knowledge about Bob Ross, I know that there is a quote unquote rivalry with Bill. Um, could you speak more on that. <laughs> yeah, so that's interesting. And I will say that that one might be a little bit more urban legend than reality. So Bob worked for Bill for many, many years. That was his first real painting job. And he kind of did anything and everything. Bill had a company a lot like Bob, he sold his own painting products and Bob worked as an, as an instructor for Bill. He helped sell his products. He knew Bill really, really well. So when Bob, you know, kind of took out on his own, Bill Alexander was pretty supportive of that. And there's actually this really iconic, weird television spot where Bill Alexander is handing over this huge paintbrush over to Bob Ross because Bill also painted with these oversized brushes. And so this was a way for Bill to communicate out to his fans that he was okay with this, that he was kind of passing the torch, that Bob was someone that he was passing the torch to. Now, a little ways down the line, um, that's where you get to the, the feudy part of, is there a feud going on? Was there a competition happening where Bill made a couple of comments about, you know, well, I'm the one that taught him how to do this. And, you know, is he more popular than me? Of course not. You know, I, I taught him everything he knows. And I think that's a pretty common thing to say. And, you know, the times that 
Bill Alexander made comments like that were a lot, a lot fewer than the times that he had nice things to say about Bob. So it, it's an interesting piece. I love looking at pop culture and seeing those things that pop up and the stories that live on and kind of take on a life of their own. And I think that's one of them. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. That paintbrush scene, I saw that and then all of a sudden, you know, they're feuding and I'm like, okay, how did that happen? <laughs> so that's good to um, know. So I know that they both did the wet on wet painting style. Um, were there other people doing the similar style um, painting shows um, at the time? That's a really, that's a really good question. So the wet on wet technique that Bob does and that Bill Alexander did is also known as the alla prima technique and that's a painting technique that's been around for centuries and centuries. Old masters used it, not all of them, but some of them did. So Bill Alexander um, really kind of popularized that technique in, in the modern, in the modern world <laughs> for us here in the United States and on TV. And when Bob came on and started his painting show, there, there were not a lot of these painting shows and artist shows, but one of the things that Bob Ross was really interested in was actually supporting other artists. So what you saw happen on PBS was you ended up with other artists who started having artist shows, people like Gordon Jenkins, people like Dorothy Dent, um, and they, they did different you know, artistic approaches or handicrafts. And that was really at the encouragement of Bob Ross because he wanted to be able to use his platform and his popularity as a microphone to really support and uplift other artists. So he really saw it as a way to, you know, get more people out in the public interested and motivated to try these new things by getting more and more art shows on the air. Okay, cool. Um, what... What has been the most surprising thing about Bob Ross or the joy of painting that you have uncovered um, while putting together the Bob Ross experience and working with Minatrista? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know if I can ever pick like the most, but I think that some of the most fun things that we've uncovered are the really micro details about the filming of the show and especially in the LL Ball House because it is literally just a historic house in the room where they filmed The Joy of Painting it was like the old living room. So this was, this was like a crammed space. It had orange carpet and there are not a lot of photos that actually exist of that room. So what's up on the screen now, that really nice black and white photo where you see the cameraman and the director sitting in the director chair, that's actually over at WIPB's modern television studio that they moved to in the late 1980s. And they moved into this really high tech slick studio over on Ball State's campus. And Bob, you know, moved with them because they were his TV station that filmed his show. Um, so this was a much different setting than what they were working with at the LL Ball House, which was close quarters, lots of stuff stacked up all over the place. But one of the real joys of working on this exhibit was getting to talk to the crew who filmed this show for Bob. You know, he really had a core crew that worked on this the entire run, filming from, you know, the early 80s through 1994. And a lot of those individuals still live in the area. They live in Muncie or around Indiana. And I had the pleasure of meeting with a lot of them and kind of picking their brains of what are the things that we don't know that no one wrote down. So I think one of my, my most favorite things that I learned is that it's an old house, makes lots of noise, right? So the radiators would pop, the floors would creak. So when they were filming The Joy of Painting, which is such a quiet show, and you only hear Bob's voice, and then like the ch -ch 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 brushing of, you know, brushes or the palette knife on the canvas, you did not want other audible noises being picked up. So they would have to turn off the furnace if it was the winter time to the house so that the radiators wouldn't pop. They had to turn off the telephones to the house so no one would be calling someone in their office. And my favorite part is that pretty much there was like a five minute bathroom morning. So 
the WIPB staff that had offices in the house, they would get the, we're going to start filming Bob in five minutes. Everybody better get up and go to the bathroom now, because as soon as we start filming an episode, you cannot move from your chair because we will be able to hear you walking and creaking on the old wooden floors above us, because that's how loud <laughs> the noises in the house were. So I think that's probably some of the most interesting things that we found out are those really kind of personal memories that don't get written down anywhere. So, you know, it's that real behind the scenes look at what was going on. I can't even imagine like doing something so calming in a space that's so loud. <laughs> like, you know, I know it's really, really funny to think about and to think about like the, the challenges that must have come with trying to have a TV studio in a historic home. And it's really funny when they moved to their their more modern facility over at Ball State. Um, I think that Bob maybe drove the crew a little bit nuts because Bob really liked the studio at the LL Ball home, that old charming historic house because it was so cozy and he thought it was just so homey. And so he was constantly, you know, like, I mean, this is nice over here, guys, but I really kind of miss being over there on Miniaturista Boulevard in the little house. And I think everyone else was just like, Bob, be quiet. This is so much better. Stop it. <laughs> That, um, I mean, I didn't know, I don't know much about Bob Ross, but that seems a very Bob Ross thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this is a, a lot of questions in one. So um, first of all, where did Bob get his ideas for his paintings? Um, and in many of his tutorials, he has different animals on the show and talks about his loves for, love for wildlife. Um, how did his love of animals influence his paintings? Mm -hmm. And could you possibly talk about Peapod or Annette? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll answer the first one first. So his ideas for his paintings came from a lot of places. He was very inspired by the landscapes around him that he took in just, you know, you see all those great mountain scenes and he was definitely influenced by his time living up in Alaska. That's where he was stationed most of the time he was in the military. So you'll see him do these paintings with these like really crazy, like all these like bright pinks on the mountains and in the sky. And people are like, that's really bright. But if you actually look at the landscape in Alaska, the sky up there does capture those colors. So he really took in life around him and used that as inspiration for his scenes. Also a little known fact is that Bob was, was an amateur photographer. He loved taking photos when he was traveling and out and about. And so he would kind of store those photos as background material for himself to go back to, to, you know, reference for those inspiring things that he wanted to capture on canvas. And he would also say that one of the best inspirations is your imagination because it's your world and you can do whatever you want. And he truly believed that, that you could take anything from your mind and mix and match those landscapes and put them together. So, you know, that landscape thing really does kind of lead into all of these critters that we see here. Bob just, he loved nature. That was just part of his personality and part of his character. And as a kid, even, he was like dragging home injured animals all the time. And they would just show up at his house and his mother would say, what are you doing? And why is this animal here? And he would be, you know, nursing them back to health. So as an adult, he loved, he loved, loved, and loved these animals. And he would take in injured animals. He would, you know, do what he could if he wasn't in the position to help, you know, care for that animal, especially in Muncie. He had a friend, Diana Schaefer, who ran a local wildlife refuge, and he would work with Diane to get um, animals over to her. So down here in the corner, you see him with this little squirrel. This is Peapod. Peapod the pocket squirrel, who made many appearances on The Joy of Painting, and for as cute as he looks on camera, the crew did not, did not think he was nearly as cute as Bob did. Apparently he had very sharp nails and would scurry up your leg and run up to your shoulder and just needle those little claws right into you. And Bob would just laugh. Um, but, you know, he, he loved all kinds of animals. He's here with a raccoon. We have him there with a bird. He wasn't picky. <laughs> if it was an animal, he, he loved it. Um, you also mentioned um, another squirrel. So he had Peapod, 
who was who was a crowd favorite. He also had a squirrel that appeared on the show that was lovingly referred to as Bobette. And Bobette was a squirrel that was named jointly after Bob and his business partner, Annette Kowalski. So they just took their two names, combined them, and that became the squirrel's name, Little Bobette. So, you know, the squirrels came and went and it, it was a way for Bob again to just share his love of something with, you know, viewers. Um, so you called Peepaw the pocket squirrel. How did, you, how did he paint with the, the pocket in his squirrel? I mean, the squirrel in his pocket <laughs> um, without being distracted. I think that he was just so calm and to be perfectly honest, I know this sounds super cheesy, but I have asked people about this. of like, what was the deal with Peapod? So a lot of times you'll see him get scurried off camera, like handed off to someone. And other times like literally squirrels just hanging out in his pocket. I think that he and that squirrel were just so comfortable with each other that the squirrel would just curl up and take a nap. And Bob was just so, you know, in tune with the animal and in tune with this painting that for him, that wasn't a problem. It wasn't a distraction. I can't imagine, like, I'm not going to have a squirrel on me and be trying to paint a painting in 27 minutes, but apparently Bob is a man of many talents. (laughs) Yeah. I I cannot even imagine. (laughs) Um, So that was actually one of our questions from our audience. Um, So we are going to move on to the questions from um, you guys. Um, so one of them that we have is, do you know why he would say beat the devil out of it when drying his brush? (laughs) So that's beating the devil out of the brush is one of my favorite things that Bob does. And I'm going to do a total plug for one of the artifacts in our collection. We have in our collection and in the exhibit, Bob's easel that he used his personal easel and on the leg of that easel. It's like the whole leg is splattered with paint and paint thinner residue that's dried on there, except for this one strip that is like completely clean from where he would do that exact thing where he would, you know, hit the brush on there and he would say he was beating the devil out of it. Why he did that, I do not know. I don't know where he came up with it, but I will say Bob really, really loved telling good stories and he really loved making people laugh. And so I think for him, because he often would actually do things on camera to try to get a rise out of the camera um, operators in the room because they would have to stay so quiet. And they were so like family-like that they were constantly doing these kinds of jokes on each other. The Bob would do things to try to get a rise out of them, which they were, you know, did not want to do because every episode of The Joy of Painting was filmed in one shot start to finish. There was no editing. There was no stopping. So my my gut is that it might have started out as one of those funny things that Bob did to try to get a reaction. And you'll just see him like genuinely giggle <laughs> when he does it on film where he just laughs at himself, but then he goes on. So that, that would be my guess because we know that he did a lot of those kinds of things, you know, just you know, having fun with his friends. Um, so I, of course, haven't watched all 30 plus seasons of his show. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Are there any um, like places where you can hear the camera people laughing or anything? No, no. They, did a very, oh. they did a very good job. If they ever had a weird ping up, which was very, very rare, um, they literally tried their darndest to not have to refilm and they only ever reshot an episode like a small handful of times over the entire 31 seasons. And to my knowledge, they never did get that on camera, but you'll like this. Um, Often, like in the last three minutes of the episode, you will see Bob be like, oh, and this is looking really good. And then he like drops a huge tree, like in the front of the painting. He's like, let's just put a big tree right here. And you're like, oh my God, Bob, there's only three minutes left. You're not going to get this tree done. Bob thought this was really funny. And so the crew that sat in the control room, which was in a different area of the house, they would be watching on monitors doing all the background stuff. And every time he would go to drop in a tree, the staff that worked in the control room, it was just like an audible, like, no, no, Bob, don't do it. And then it would be, you know, this very fun thing of, is Bob going to get it finished? Is he going to get it finished? 
He always got the tree finished, but very occasionally he didn't get the painting signed because he was so close on time. That's funny. Um, so did he only paint in, um, sorry, in oils on his show or what kind of mediums did he use? He only painted in oils on the show. That is all that he did. That's what he stuck with. So he always used oil paint and he always used the same set um, color options. And that was something that he specifically did when the joy of painting was airing for the first time. It was definitely not like watching TV today. <laughs> you can like pause your live TV and back up and do all of that stuff, which would actually be really great for watching the joy of painting or being able to pull it up on YouTube. So by having this same set of materials that he used for every episode, it was his way of making sure that his viewers, if they wanted to paint along, could be prepared. So they also didn't have to invest in buying like a thousand different shades of oil paint. You know, you only needed this set handful of colors and that's what you would work with every week. So you could go buy your stuff once at the beginning of the season and in theory have what you needed going forward. So that was a really purposeful thing that he did to make it accessible to the public. That's um, awesome to know because I have been planning on painting along with Bob. Um, so to know that it will be simple <laughs> is great to know. Um, so for these paintings, um, how did Bob choose his subjects? Um, and were they replicas of real places or fictional places? A combination. <laughs> so some of them were absolutely, you know, replicas of real places. Some of them were things where he would take a, you know, a little bit from here, a tree from here, and maybe, you know, this scene that he saw somewhere else. And he would combine them to make these landscapes that he just thought would be really beautiful. And in terms of how he would pick them out, so every season has 13 episodes. And he was really methodical about selecting the paintings for each season. So often people will say, oh, well, Bob Ross, like the paintings all kind of look the same and they just repeat, but they are all unique. If you look at every episode, they are all unique. And Bob was really thoughtful about thinking through that season as a whole and giving a good breadth of different kinds of landscapes. So you'll see, you know, mountainscapes, seascapes, um, I really love when you'll see um, riverscapes with maple trees, oak trees in fall colors, because every time I see those, they look a lot like East Central Indiana to me. And where he, where the LL Ball home was on the White River. So I think there was a lot of inspiration coming from the Midwest in harvest time and those golden colors that are so, you know, familiar to all of us and that I think Bob just just loved. So he was really selective and would plan them out in advance and get those lined up and ready to go. And pro tip, if you ever get your hand on one of those instructional booklets, in the middle, there's an insert card that's stapled in. That insert card every time went in at Bob's favorite painting from the season. So if you ever want to know what Bob's favorite painting was from the season, that's where it's at. That's awesome. Um, I really want to get my hands on one of those. <laughs> um, so kind of going on to his scenes that he painted, um, was the only thing that he did landscapes? Um, mm -hmm. The person in the audience says that they saw many of his shows and they were magical, but wondered if he did other types of paintings. Yeah, so on the show, Bob only ever did landscapes. Um, at some point, someone asked him, you know, Bob, you know, would you consider doing a portrait, you know, a painting portrait on the show? And Bob said, no. And they said, oh, you, you don't paint people? And he said, no, I can paint a lot of things. You know, in my free time, I, I try out all different kinds of subjects. But the point of my show is to inspire budding artists to be brave and to try new things. So he wanted to make sure that what he was presenting on the show wasn't too hard because he didn't want his viewer to fail. He was very concerned that if the viewer failed, that that would kill all of the, you know, burn and desire that he was able to inspire in people to be creative. So he was very selective and only did landscapes. He never did people. Um, in his free time, you know, he played around with other things. He actually 
even as an adult, would draw lots of little cartoons. <laughs> a lot of his friends that I have spoken to all tell these really similar stories of going out to dinner with him. And he would just like pull out a pen and he would pull out a napkin and make little cartoons and often would then give them to his friends as, you know, a, a gift of, hey, I drew, I drew this cartoon of you. Here you go. So he, he was very well versed in what he did. But on the show, he kept it he kept it pretty tight for a pretty specific reason. That makes complete sense because I can never draw faces or people. And not right, all. and people are intimidated by having to draw people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so for the show, how did Bob come up with his catchphrases like happy little trees? Um, did the directors and writers come up with that or was that just all him? It's all Bob. So Bob never, never had a written script. That said, he was very planned out and he himself would go through and prep for himself what he planned to say, what he planned to do and in what order on every episode, but he did not have a script writer. No one else did that for him. All of his little, you know, phrases of, you know, no mistakes, only happy accidents, the happy little clouds. That's all just Bob and his personality and the way he talked as a person. Um, when we started doing our research for this exhibit, I was, I was really worried that like I was going to find out that Bob on TV was just a personality and that wasn't actually Bob. But what we learned from talking to his friends, to, you know, his family, to his business partners, to people that just knew him and interacted with him, what you see on TV, that was the real Bob. That's how he talked. That's what his demeanor was like. He was just that genuine and that kind and calming and you know just a, an approachable guy that's awesome because I know it's sometimes disheartening when you you know hear of someone that you love on tv are horrible people right right and you find out that oh that's just the persona that they take yeah. on that is that's not who they are at all yeah oh so yeah to hear that that that's all him is super um like helpful and like makes me happy <laughs> exactly right um so does pbs ever play reruns or is youtube the only way to access these episodes um and can you remind us how many seasons were recorded i can <laughs> there were 31 seasons recorded with 13 episodes in each season so that's like 400 and a few episodes to watch so pbs um does still air Episodes of The Joy of Painting constantly. Uh, they are distributed through American Public Television, who services all of our PBS stations, you know, locally around the country. And they have been constantly showing Bob from the time that he started airing in the early 80s. They never stopped. They've been continually airing Bob. So you can get to episodes there. You can also get to all of the episodes on YouTube. You can see them there. Um, there's kind of a handful of, I'll call them curated collections of episodes of The Joy of Painting on some streaming services. So there's, there's like a lot of ways you can get to Bob and you can partake of The Joy of Painting. But I think it's really interesting that, you know, PBS has been continually airing the show this entire time. It just, it holds up really well. And it, it does not age in a bad way. And a lot of that was actually really purposeful on, on Bob. He, he thought through things, keeping the set basic was to keep attention on the paintings, but also so it wouldn't get dated really quick. I actually find it really funny because he was really thoughtful about that. And he always wore blue jeans and a button up shirt because he thought that would look classic for like years and years and years in case the show ever you know went into syndication or they were running reruns. And it's really funny because there's that aspect, but then his hair, which, which looked dated when he was doing the show. So it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, that hair is not timeless. <laughs> no, no. Um, so, I mean, that kind of explains why um, his legacy is so important to the past, present, and future generations is because it was, it's everywhere, you know? And I think that that's awesome is that it's a way to connect all the generations. Yeah, absolutely. That that's the thing about Bob. His his show remains popular, I think, because his message doesn't get old and it's still really applicable to everyone because deep down at the heart of it, the joy of painting is sure about painting. Bob didn't didn't expect everyone to paint though. So if you really boil it down and look at what he was saying, what he was saying was 
try new things. Be inspired to go out on a limb. That's where you might find some new fruit. You know, he just wanted to inspire the joy of life in people and the joy of trying new things. And if you picked up a paintbrush and did it that way with him, oh, he was tickled pink. He loved it when people painted. But if that's not how you wanted to experience and try out new things or experience the joy of life, he was just as happy to learn that, you know, you went out and you tried doing this new thing that you had never thought you could do. It didn't matter, you know, it could have been cooking, could have been painting, it could have been running or hiking, anything really. And if, if he heard that someone had taken that away from his show, he, he was happy and he thought he had done his job and what he was wanting to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bob actually like came to me in a really tough time in my life and like that really helped me, um, you know, feel better. And like, I'm like, well, Bob thinks I can do it. He believes in me. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's, that's the thing. I think Bob was there to, to support people. He really wanted to connect with, with one viewer, the viewer that was on the other side of that TV. So he, you'll see in his delivery that he always talks to one person. And that's because he was trying to connect with that one person in a really intimate way on the other side of the TV between him and you in your living room. And, you know, he just wanted, he just wanted to touch lives in a way that he thought was meaningful and put, you know, goodness out into the world. Yeah, I think we can both agree that that is, that is what happened. Um, so what has happened to the paintings that he painted? Um, did he paint outside the show to sell them? Um, and could you possibly talk more about Bob Ross Inc? Yeah, so the paintings that he painted on the show, with the exception of a handful, in theory, when he painted the paintings on the show, they were painted on his own company time for his company, Bob Ross Incorporated. So all of those paintings that were done on the show went back to the company into their holdings. So they own the vast majority of the paintings that were done on the show. There are a few rogue ones because Bob was generous. And occasionally those paintings didn't make it back to the company because he would give one away to a friend because they really liked the painting from the show. So you'll find some of those out there. We have, um, we have 27 Bob Ross originals in our collection. Some of those are paintings that were done either as reference paintings or as on-camera paintings for the show that have been donated to us by Bob Ross Incorporated. But we also have in our collection a small handful of paintings that were Bob's that he did on his personal time, that he had hanging in his personal home that were donated to us by his widow um, when he passed away. Also, we have a handful of paintings that Bob himself donated to us in the early 90s when he had done that exhibit that I mentioned earlier with us in the early 90s. He did um, some painting classes, these big outdoor painting sessions with us at Minatrista, and so he donated all of those paintings to us. Otherwise, he, he really didn't paint to sell on his free time, but he was known to sell a painting. <laughs> if, if he was doing a demonstration in a mall and someone said, I really like that painting, I'd like to buy it, Bob would sell it to you. Not at an inflated price, but he would sell it. More often though, the paintings that you find in private hands are either ones that he gave to friends he was very generous and he was painting all the time. So he would give paintings to friends. And he also painted a lot of canvases that were given to PBS stations around the country to be used for fundraisers. So in the 80s and 90s, a lot of these paintings of his were auctioned off by PBS stations as fundraising mechanisms. So you'll find a lot of them in private homes now that people got through, you know, the PBS fund drive kind of thing. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, how he had the finished painting off to the side for reference? Yeah, yeah. So he always looks so off the cuff, right, when he's on the show and he's like, oh, and I think we should put a little cloud here. Yeah, he had a, he had a reference painting <laughs> off camera. Uh, every time he, in planning out what his paintings were going to be, 
for every season, he would literally paint them as many times as he needed to, to get them right to where he wanted, because he knew we only had 27 minutes on camera. So he needed to have a roadmap to get him where he was going. So once he had it right, that would become the reference painting. So whenever he would come to the studio to film, he'd bring in the season's worth of reference paintings and they would get lined up along the wall in the room. And then for whichever episode he was filming, that painting would get pulled out and they had a variety of ways of doing it. Sometimes it would go on a second easel off to the side, sometimes just like on an old music stand. Sometimes it would get hung up by like a piece of fishing line, kind of just right out of camera. But very occasionally, if you pay attention while he's painting in the show, you'll see him kind of look off to the side a little bit longer than he should. And what he's usually doing is looking at that reference painting to see what needs to come next, decide if he's going to get the whole painting in, and if he doesn't think he has enough time, what he's going to cut from the painting to make what he's doing on camera work. That makes me feel better about my own uh, paintings because I always have references. <laughs> <laughs> so to so know that he did that makes me feel better. Oh yeah, he's a total human and does what everyone would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the cheap um, were his last minute trees on the reference or was that just no one knew about that? Sometimes they were on the reference, sometimes no one knew. That's the fun of, if you can see some of the reference paintings against the on-camera ones, they, there are differences in them, like little differences here and there. And we have a, a handful of sets in our collection that are either an on-camera painting and the reference painting or the on-camera painting and then there was always a third copy done that was photographed step by step for those instructional booklets that he sold and it's really fun to look at those and see where the differences are and see where Bob maybe didn't have time for something or added something fun in <laughs> on air to see you know what he could do. Yeah that's awesome to see him like side by side <laughs> for sure. Um, one thing that has been asked is um can we talk did he have like a religious or spiritual life um that was important to his paintings oh that's that's an interesting question so from our research and from talking with people that knew him I think that you could say that Bob was a spiritual man Bob you know you know, believed that there was a higher being. Um, you'll hear him on his closing of every show. He says, you know, God bless. Um, but that said, I can't really speak specifically to what, what that role was in the paintings themselves and in what drove him. I think that he generally was spiritual and, you know, had a belief system behind him. I'm not sure that that belief system necessarily drove all of the decisions in, in his painting per se, but I think there's certainly an influence there. I think you can see that also just in general with his love of nature and this concept of kind of communing with nature and that concept, I know a lot of people, you know, see being out in nature as kind of being with God. I think that there's, there's a correlation there. Okay, that's super interesting. I had no idea. <laughs> Um, so we do have one last question before we go. We want to make sure that we plug um, the Bob Ross experience. Um, what kind of things would you get to do if you came to the Bob Ross experience um, and how long will it be up for guests um, to see? And could you talk a little bit more about your shirt? <laughs> this is my Bob Ross experience t-shirt, which is an exclusive t-shirt that you can get at our gift shop at Minatrista. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, our graphic designer uh, made for us using this, this very fluffy Bob Ross head, which is our logo for the exhibit. So when you come visit, what you'll get to do at the Bob Ross experience is be prepared for what I would call an immersive exhibit. So when you come in, you will find some familiar things that you tend to find in more traditional museum exhibits. There'll be some panels with some really cool archival photos and interesting information. But the way that we've designed this is we really want you to feel like you are there. So one of the spaces is a recreation of that television studio and you can literally walk right up to Bob's easel. All of the original artifacts that we've included, we've been really creative to find ways to keep them safe, but we want you to get close to them. So something to know is that a lot of the information, instead of just being out on exhibit labels, 
you find them the more you interact with the exhibit. So if you see a shirt hanging on um, a clothes rack, pick up the shirt, check inside, you might find something. So most of it is actually hands-on and touchable because we want you to interact with the things in there. We want you to find those discoverables. So kind of the more you dig, the more you'll find. And besides the um, exhibit, the Bob Ross Experience, which is a long-term exhibit for us. So it will be up for, for a while. We can, we can accommodate you when you feel ready to come and safe to visit. Also until mid-August of this year, we have up a complimentary exhibit called Bob Ross at Home, Artist Teacher Friend, which is in another one of our gallery spaces in another historic home that's right next to the LL Ball home. And what that is, is that's a special exhibition of Bob Ross original paintings that are mostly sourced from community members. Um, who own personal Bob Ross paintings. And so it's showing those off and telling the stories of those paintings, how they got them, how they were created by Bob. And the last thing that I'll toss out there is that we also run Bob Ross um, painting workshops where we bring in certified Ross instructors. So you can sign up for a class. We run them on specific dates. Um, and you can find all of that information on our website for when those classes are. And you can come and you can paint with a certified Ross instructor and really put kind of Bob's message into practice and try putting a little paint on canvas, which is which is always fun. I've, I've seen a lot of people, myself included, who say, this is not gonna look good when I get done. There's no way. And then you finish and you're like, wow, that actually looks like a thing. So it's true, anybody can do it. It's definitely on my list. Um, just real quick, what are the uh, COVID proceed, uh, sorry, yeah, procedures um, for the exhibit, if it is yeah. hands-on? Yep, absolutely. So we are working very hard to keep our visitors safe. So we have a variety of measures in place. At the current time, we have limited capacity in the experience to make sure that we are keeping people spread out. Also, we have timed ticketing. So if you do get a ticket, you will want to purchase a timed ticket. That way we can control, you know, spacing people out how many times they're in the how many people are in the house at one time. Um, and also with that, our time ticketing allows us, we've worked in extra, you know, cleaning and sanitizing schedules to make sure that we are keeping a safe space, a clean space for our visitors. We're also providing loads of hand sanitizer <laughs> while you're on our site. So we definitely have that in mind. You know, all guests are required to wear masks at this time, you know, out of respect for everyone around them. So we are working to keep you safe when you come visit us at Minatrista. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Jess, for talking to us about Bob Ross. I've had a ton of fun um, just learning more. So I am going to go ahead and pass it back to Callie. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you guys so much. Um, I can't wait to come up and see the exhibit and see if I find a hidden squirrel maybe in the exhibit. Um, one of our guests was wondering if you had a hidden squirrel. So I can't wait to find that. Well, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give away the secret here, but come look. <laughs> um, and I am always going to imagine how you domesticate a squirrel. That's a, <laughs> maybe a conversation for a different day. But thank you all so much for attending tonight. We appreciate everyone taking the time and especially Jessica and Cheyenne for talking to us. Um, if you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider coming back for more. As we mentioned at the top of the program, we have more history happy hours coming to you. Join us for a history of Hoosier basketball on March 25th. Lots of basketball history coming at you um, as March Madness gets going. And then stay tuned for more history happy hours coming soon in April, May, and beyond. And then we hope, um, it is Women's History Month, um, and we hope you'll join us on March 30th to talk about some women who acted outside of social norms to make change in Indiana. We call it Women Behaving Badly. It's one of my favorite programs of the year. So come join me and Cheyenne and a whole bunch of our friends to learn about the ladies that made trouble um, and changed our state for the better. It is our National History Day season. We are officially in process. Um, this is where students conduct and share original historical research, and we've gone virtual this year. 
We need your help to help to judge students projects at our contest. You don't need any prior experience. You don't need to be a historian, but help us mold minds, change lives and support our students. Um, Marianne is going to put a link in the chat for you where you can learn out how to find more and especially volunteer for our state contest coming at you on May 1st. And you can sign up for all of this and more virtual offerings at indianahistory.org slash visit slash calendar. There is also a link that will be in your inbox tomorrow as well as in the chat right now. This conversation will post to YouTube in the upcoming weeks and our website. In the meantime, if you would like to learn more from other history happy hours, learn about topics like Ohio River Pirates, cemeteries, learn from Jess about suffrage and the stuff that the suffragettes suffragists, there we go, leave, left behind. You can watch those replays on our website that's also in the chat for you. You'll get an email from us tomorrow morning with these, all these links and a survey. It will take you one minute. We'd love to know what you thought and how we can continue to offer programs like this in the